with DJ Leroy. Night Watchman. How you doing, buddy? I'm well. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. Uh, how was your week? Uh, week is wonderful. Yeah. Well, I had a little rough week uh, weekend last weekend. You know why? I was watching the European Championships and both my teams lost. I mean, first uh, England loses to, of, of course, you know. Uh, oh God! Now it, it's it's such a bitter memory. I just blocked it out. But I'll say on the Copa America, Brazil lost to Argentina as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was of of course that they lost to Italy, mm -hmm. and it was and it was oh God, it was rough. So you know what? Instead of that. Why don't we just talk about business? Yeah, because I'm a classic American. I don't care about soccer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go right in there. You just let let people know where you stand all the time. Go ahead. Isn't, that, isn't it better that way? <laughs> yeah. I guess so. I guess so, indeed. So, but you let's, know what? Let's, let's not waste our time with this silly banter when we have a, a really interesting crew of people that we're going to talk to today so tell us a little bit about our guests and what we're going to be talking about well first of all i'm going to um actually bring up a young lady who i met uh in my in my real job right my mm -hmm. nine to five and mm -hmm. that of course is miss angelina ramirez miss ramirez when i first met her she was the executive director of the washington heights bid she is now the founder and ceo of the amlin group bring out angelina angelina Good How evening. You, hey, Welcome. Good <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. The next woman is funny enough. Met her on a high school reunion. Can you believe that? Can we say go divers and peg legs all the way? <laughs> <laughs> the the one, the only was Dina Tobin, who was the president and visionary strategist of Dina Tobin and Associates LLC. Bring her out, Dina. Good evening. Thank you okay. for inviting me. Welcome. Absol absolutely. Uh, another woman is funny. Not only did I meet her in, in my job at the, um, w with Harlem CDC, but this woman is not only a real, real a visionary, but she has a specialty in working uh, primarily with nonprofit organizations in the small business space. Bring, bring out Miss Barbara Grummet. Barbara. Hello, everyone. Right, right, and and then, you know what? We got got to mix it up. We got to bring a, another guy out here so we can balance things out here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, having worked on the city side at uh, SBS, he now has started his own uh, brand and business, and that of course being Progress Playbook, Mr. Lloyd Cambridge. Lloyd, hey, hey, hey. welcome, Lloyd. Everybody, all right. So you know what? Let's get get right into it. I I, I definitely want to. Find out from each of you. I'll go around, okay? I want to hear your journey in this particular space. Mm -hmm. Let's start it out. Angelina, take it away. My journey was uh, definitely not a straight path. I, uh, I obtained an MBA at NYU and went to corporate for uh, 10 years. Bad joke, but I tell people I gave people lung cancer, made them obese, and put them in debt because I worked at brands such as uh, Philip Morris on the Marlboro brand team, PepsiCo on the Pepsi brand team, and then I went to American Express. And I was never happy at each of those companies. And I thought, let me, you know, I was at Philip Morris first, then I jumped to Pepsi, wasn't happy there. And I had my dream job to do multicultural marketing. Then I went to American Express and I wasn't happy there. So I took a leap of faith, did a 180, and went into the nonprofit industry, becoming the director of the Washington Heights bid, which for me was a great, um, a great transition because I was still doing marketing and, and business development like I did in corporate, uh, but I was really helping um, the community from a, from a grassroots perspective. And then after eight years there, I decided that it was time to launch my own business uh, after eight years of seeing entrepreneurs and seeing them white knuckle it and, and seeing all the amazing work that they've done and and really the um, you know just the the, the self esteem and the and just the, how proud they are of, of being a small business owner. I decided to do it myself. Uh, so today, you know, I am the founder of the Amblin Group, and we do do marketing and business development. Uh, but I am very specific with my marketing because there are a lot of marketing companies out there. So today I do multicultural and DEI marketing. 
but it's been a, a, a great uh, ride. I'm not gonna say it's been the easiest of transitions, going from a paycheck to no paycheck, but it's great that I had support from my uh, family, from my friends, from my colleagues. And today I could definitely say that, uh, you know, we, we are, you know, revenue is great, sales are great. We actually did really well during COVID, which I don't know if that's a good or bad thing to say, but uh, we're, we're blessed. And, and you know, today we, we know that, um, you know, I have uh, partners that I work with and uh, we're on, it's a good transition today. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, Dina, your journey. Thank you. Well, um, I don't know how far back you want to go, but uh, I, I went to grad school at CW for um, international affairs, international economics, worked for the federal government for a while in international trade, and then worked for a um, trade association and a consulting firm in international development, which is working with overseas projects with uh, U.S. Agency for International Development and the World Bank and other donor organizations. And about seven, eight years into that, I decided I wanted to start my own company, kind of hit the proverbial glass ceiling. I had small children. There wasn't a lot of flexibility in the job world at that point. So I started my own business, Dina Tobin and Associates, and focused on um, proposal development, working with a lot of government contractors to help them write proposals and reports provided editorial assistance. And then over the years, um, actually transitioned into more of an uh, executive role where I hire other consultants now who do focus on proposal development, editorial assistance, graphic design. And in the past year and a half, we've pivoted to add more um, webinars to our portfolio and that's when I've been working with a lot of uh, small business associations across the United States to reach small businesses during this challenging time and help them with their marketing. So I've, I've been doing a lot of um, marketing for challenging times, which is also the name of my ebook that accompanies the webinar and talked about other webinars on finding new income streams and the um, different designations to work with the federal government. So I'm really um, been excited about helping people, helping other small businesses and uh, helping them succeed because they're really, you know, the, the heart of the U.S. economy. And so many people are trying to start new businesses or struggling with their businesses. Many have closed, unfortunately. So I think, you know, this past year and a half has really shown us we're all in this together and we really need to help one another. So that's my story. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, ba Barbara, do tell, because certainly I know the acronym uh, Service Corps of Retired Executives, SCORE. Yes. Tell us your journey. Okay. Um, I currently am a volunteer and a chapter president for SCORE, which is a national nonprofit focused on helping small businesses. We work with clients in New, primarily in New York City who are interested in starting businesses, uh, for-profit and not-for-profit. We also uh, work with and, and helping them with various business problems at, once they are up and running. We have about 80 chapter members uh, throughout New York City. We work primarily, as I said before, with, with clients in the city. During COVID, we pivoted immediately to uh, Zoom and telephone mentoring. So we've managed to continue with a lot of uh, able to help a lot of clients. We helped a lot of people in New York City navigate the uh, challenges of the various funding and relief programs that Congress turned out in an effort to try to help keep the economy afloat. And now we're, t we're focusing primarily on helping uh, businesses navigate the recovery and uh, restart for those who are planning to reopen and pivot for those who need to uh, move about. My journey, uh, I started out in higher education and uh, for many years I was a college professor, I was a dean. Um, I retired several years ago as an academic dean at CUNY, uh, the City Tech campus in Brooklyn. 
I've also been involved with nonprofits for decades. I was a founding board member, a board member, a board chairperson. Um, I was a CEO of a nonprofit that was headquartered here in New York City. So, and now I'm a volunteer. So I've sort of come full circle and many of my clients are nonprofits as, as Curtis mentioned earlier. And one of the fun parts of my job is that we mentor all clients all over the city. And before the lockdown, I was up in the uh, Harlem CDC uh, one day a month mentoring clients primarily from the Harlem area who would come to the office for in-person mentoring. Absolutely. She has definitely the speciality that everybody seeks out Barbara when they say, I have this nonprofit that I want to start. Where's Barbara Grubman? For sure. And, and Lloyd, you know what? I did not know the journey in terms of uh, SBS and you're doing some time there. So please do tell us Progress Playbook. Yes, yes. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name uh -huh. is Cambridge again. Um, and, you know, um, the name of my company is called Progress Playbook. We design uh, customized entrepreneurship programs for organizations. So government, nonprofits, corporations. Um, I just remember being uh, 10 years old, growing up in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and uh, wanting to start a business as a young person, but always lacked the confidence and resources and uh, support and guidance and all of those things. Um, so I was always a dreamer. Um, and my, that dream kind of stayed with me for a very long time. Uh, so I wound up still dreaming while I went to college. I went to NYU, studied economics, then worked for um, JP Morgan Chase doing uh, asset based lending for uh, apparel, textile and jewelry companies. Uh, still dreaming as an entrepreneur. I want to be an entrepreneur, but never started anything. Uh, um, and then went on after that to work for the Department of Small Business Services here in New York, managing two of their business service centers in Queens and the Bronx, uh, NYC Business Solutions Centers, uh, and still being a dreamer. But, you know, so throughout my career, I supported a ton of entrepreneurs and small business owners. Uh, and then event, you know, uh, finally, six years ago, I jumped uh, with the help of two friends. They pushed me out of the... Uh, you know, off the off the cliff a little bit and said, you keep talking about starting a business, do something about it. So six years ago, I started Progress Playbook. Um, just really leveraging all of my skills from our previous work. Uh, and we design like customized programs. So we like one of the projects we're working on right now is um, designing, calling it a business school, but a program uh, for NYCHA residents uh, to help them to start businesses in the construction, pest control, and janitorial um, industries, um, and to be able to get access to contracts with NYCHA as well. That's like one example. We've also done a project with like SBS to support bodegas throughout the city uh, to help them to offer healthier foods and to upgrade their stores um, and things like that. So uh, it's been an interesting ride <laughs> and looking forward to talking more about it. I uh, hear you. <laughs> very nice very nice so so bottom line and you, and you said it lord you know uh most po people only dream about starting a business uh but it takes more than dreams to make that business real so what issues have uh, any of you guys identified as the number one uh cause of your clients either demise or success okay um uh, weigh in uh angelina Oh, not outsourcing. I think a lot of businesses think that they can do it all on their own, right? And I say, you know, I am a marketer, uh, but I am not an accountant. I am not a lawyer. Um, my team is composed of, of people that have the skill sets that I do not have. Um, and I am very proud to say I do not have my accounting. Uh, but in all seriousness, I am, um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of businesses, uh, owners, entrepreneurs feel that they have to bootstrap and have to do it all. Uh, but I, I tell them that, you know, if their specialty is painting, that's what they should specialize in and they should get, uh, you know, professionals to help them with, with the other aspects of, of their company. So, yeah, I, I would say uh, diverse, um, I'm sorry, outsourcing those uh pieces of the business that they don't really have skills in and then in the end can ding them right because god forbid they get audited god forbid they don't pay you know the appropriate taxes 
um, they don't have the appropriate licenses or insurance. So yeah, I, I would say that they um, they try to do it all and they, they should really outsource a lot of those pieces of the business that they don't have expertise in. Almost forgot about muting. You know, this new day and age, Night Watchman, what's going on here? So, Dina, do, do tell us some of, some of the things that you've identified in counseling with the small business community. Sure. Well, I, I totally agree with Angelina that um, you, need, you need other resources. You, you cannot do it on your own. Even though it says, you know, solo entrepreneur or, you know, solo enterprise, you're not solo. And I would say asking for help. Mm -hmm. asking for help, even if you don't know exactly what you need. I, I've been working with some of the um, small business development centers across the U.S., also SCORE and other um, organizations that help small businesses. And even, you know, during the pandemic, you know, I've been in business for more than 20 years. I reached out and got a business mentor, got a financial mentor, because I was like, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are hesitant or you know, well, it's going to take a lot of time and um, I don't know what to ask. And, you know, they have a lot of questions. So I think just just go for it. Just sign up and have a discussion. And um, I can tell you in my discussions, with my business mentor, I mean, things come up. He has a lot of suggestions that I didn't, you know, he wouldn't even th have thought of. A lot of connections, offers, you know, discounts to business planning software, helps with sam.gov and and so there's um there's just a lot of resources out there that and they're free i should say that they're free <laughs> if taxes favor them so um go you know go out and get and get get the help and build as angelina said you know build your team so you have that support system to to keep you going especially at the beginning uh, certainly and and barbara a lot of times uh, folks do not necessarily know the real, real concept of what a nonprofit organization does. It yeah. should be operated like a business. Mm -hmm. and, and so please tell me some of the pitfalls you encounter in counseling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, several pitfalls. Uh, one of the first ones is the uh, nonprofits are fairly highly regulated in New York. They're not as, they're perhaps not as reg heavily regulated as immediate health care or food handling kinds of enterprises. But um, you have to be incorporated. And one of the biggest issues that many of my clients face is they come in and they say, I want to start a nonprofit. I want my nonprofit to do blah, blah, blah. Well, mm -hmm. in New York State, there is no I <laughs> in, <laughs> in um, creating a nonprofit because you have to have a board of directors and they are legally responsible for making the organization run. So I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest surprises that some of my clients face. The other one is how long it takes to get the nonprofit up and running and get to the point where you can qualify for uh, seeking funding, meaning getting a tax exempt status from the IRS if that's necessary. To qualify for grants and contracts, you usually have to have been in business for one to three years, depending on the funding organization. And so planning for how are you going to operate during that time when you're up and running, trying to get programs started, trying to get some vis visibility, and then qualify for being able to raise funds at least if you're looking for a tax exempt uh, status for the, for the funding. So um, a lot of nonprofits struggle. Most of them in New York are tiny, tiny, tiny revenues of $10,000 a year or less. And a lot of my clients are surprised at that too. They think I'll form a nonprofit, I'll get a grant, I'll be the CEO, I'll make a nice salary, I'll be able to do, I'll be able to do the good things I want to do. And the answer is yes, you can do that, but it takes a lot longer and a lot more work and a lot more help from experts, as my colleagues uh, on the panel have already mentioned. So Barbara, you're telling me that uh, money just doesn't fall from the trees once you get your nonprofit status? No, it's like any other business and even more challenging quite often for nonprofits. I mean, Americans are very, very generous, but they also want to, they want to invest in winners and they want to make sure that their money is being used properly. So those are challenges for any startup nonprofit. Gotcha. Lloyd, tell us uh, some of the challenges you've seen with your clients. Um, yeah, I think 
there's so many challenges, but I think one of the challenges uh, definitely is focus. I think I always say like as an entrepreneur, um, you know, it's like having a white canvas and you can literally paint anything you want. Um, so as an entrepreneur, many people have like a ton of ideas when they're first starting out, especially. Um, so I think, you know, focusing in on like one product or one service and doing that one thing really well versus like diluting yourself across like five, 20 different things that you want to do between I want to do merch. I want to offer this product and that product. Um, and then they wind up diluting um, their, themselves in terms of their time and energy and their ability to, uh, to scale, I think is one thing that I see a lot of is, is kind of a lack of focus. Uh, we mentioned like process. I don't think a lot of organizations, unfortunately, focus in on helping entrepreneurs, especially at a certain stage, uh, to standardize their processes uh, to be able to scale. Um, so you kind of go through these stages of business startup being one of them, then you kind of legitimize. Um, and then <clears throat> once you kind of figure out your business model and you are solidified in that, um, it's really about standardizing, I think, your processes so that you can get yourself out of <laughs> doing uh, all of the work and you can begin to hire and build the team. Uh, but a lot of the processes live in people's heads um, and they don't have a place to kind of put, you know, step by step how you run and operate certain functions or verticals in your business, um, which delays the the scaling process. Um, and I think somebody else mentioned the last problem I'll say is this is really understanding your strengths and your weaknesses um, as a business owner, especially a solo entrepreneur. You know, you're responsible for being the entrepreneur, which is like the sales piece and the visioning. And then you also have like the technician piece, which is doing the work. And then the management piece, which is like all of the back office stuff. A lot of entrepreneurs are not great back office people. They're like visionaries and I want to sell and be relationship oriented, or they're really great at being technicians. Um, so really being able to uh, identify your strengths and bring people on that can support you in those other, one of those other areas that you're not the best at, I think is another challenge as well. Mm. Yeah, that definitely. Uh Two, two of those things I definitely glean. Uh, first one, Angelina, and you both said that, you know, re realizing yeah. your strength, mm -hmm. that you can do this, let's say, one thing, you're good at it, so you need to get uh, consultants or, or delegate to others who have expertise in other areas. And then, as you said, Lloyd, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got this great idea for a restaurant, but uh, yes, but I also want to sell these shirts here that will brand the restaurant. And I also, you know, I also have a pool that I can actually t teach lessons. I mean, <laughs> like, how do you how do you talk them away from the, the ledge, man? I just, you know, uh, focus, focus, focus. So let's say strategic strategic planning is like a roadmap to success. If you know where you're going, you're more likely to get there. Experts recommend two common methods of business planning, integrated plans and structural plans. Now, is, um, here it goes, do I need a business plan? Can I just open up? Do tell, Angelina. You know what? I, I say yes. Um, and, and I think it's for that reason that Lloyd mentioned, right? Um, it just provides you with focus. And mind you, I, I, as he was talking, I'm like, shoot, that is one of my problems, right? Because, you know, when sometimes you're presented with such great opportunities and other partners, and it's, it's hard to say no. Um, I've recently, like, at the beginning of this year, I started saying no, because I was being pulled in so many different directions. And in the end, I actually went back to my business plan. I'm like, what is it that I set out to do when I first started this, right? And it was be, to be an expert in this field and to focus on multicultural and DEI, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do because it keeps you on the on the straight and, and narrow. Um, it also does give you, I wrote my business plan with a one, three, and five-year plan, right? And it, and it helps you understand where you are uh, and where you want to go and what you need to get to that, you know, end goal. And even if you don't reach that one-year goal, that three-year goal, that five-year goal, at least you know you're making progress, right? So, yes, I am a believer of the business plan. Um, you know, to be honest with you, I go to the – SCORE has a really great business plan on their website, but it is 29 pages. So I don't um, – I personally use that one, but I have different templates for different uh, clients. 
and um, and I help them with it. But sometimes even a three pager or a five pager is good enough to, to, to provide them with focus and they can revisit uh, because it's always it's an organic document right and it and it changes but yes i i personally am a believer of the business plan dina do tell yes um i also think it's it's very critical to plan at the beginning even if you don't really know what you're doing i mean especially if you don't really know what you're doing and you're like you have an idea but to get down the facts and the figures especially like how much do I need, uh, you know, how am I going to fund this? Am I bootstrapping it? Am I asking family and friends? Am I going to do a, um, crowdfunding? There's a lot of options. And then how much do I need each month to pay all my bills and, you know, or break even and to make a profit and, and what, um, what kind of clients will be the most profitable or products or services the most profitable. So if you can lay out those, those, um figures and then it helps you to conceptualize your business um your business plan your business okay so maybe it you know it, it can help you narrow your focus as lloyd and angela said on what you know is most profitable what may be the easiest for you to get started to do and then roll out other things six months a year down the line so i think um and as angeline said there's there are a lot of business plan templates out there many of them are free mm -hmm. and you can um you know modify them use them as, as you as you wish but i um during i mean during the last year <laughs> the p word the pandemic um i mean still going on but the heart of it <laughs> when it's really bad and i was in a webinar and, and the, the presenter was like well you need to plan this out and i was like how can we even plan you know everything's so up in the air and, and he said well just do it even if everything changes just to have it and you know makes you think about about what you know what you're doing and and where you're going so i i think it's a tool so i think it's it's a good tool for your toolbox now, there's there's been a fundamental shift in how um small businesses develop because of the internet and and let's talk about that a little bit because nowadays every business is an online business and um and lead development has changed as well the internet has made reaching your client a lot easier so how have you guys seen in terms of adopting what you're doing to um to basically account for the changes that the internet brings toward uh, developing a small business. Who are you directing that to? Uh, anyone. Well, I can. Barbara, go ahead. I'll jump in a little bit. Um, and, and thank you for the endorsement of the uh, SCORE business plan. I, I'm ashamed to say I do not usually recommend that my clients start your business planning with that document because <laughs> they, they sort of run screaming from it but, um, <laughs> but it's really crucial so the idea of adapting to an online environment is really um in some ways it's a lot easier to provide services online uh, if you're a service-based business because uh i think client certainly during the the lockdown there were no alternatives but what we have discovered at score is the clients and mentors actually enjoy the online, the the face to face experience from the comfort and convenience of their homes, so that they don't have to commute to an appointment. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's going to be with us for a long time. You know, we're trying to figure out that balance between in person and in person experience and a one on one mentoring. Um, uh, certainly for our services uh, online. So I think that's going to be a way of the future. The other side of it is, though, I think in terms of selling goods, um, we are finding, and I think every small business person is finding it, yeah, everybody's online. So how the heck do you find, how do customers find you and your business? And it isn't just a matter, as I, you know, we tell our, our we're going to, I put up a website, I have my logo. And I can't tell you how many clients, I, I'm not being dismissive, but I think a lot of clients uh, don't appreciate how complicated beyond mm -hmm. having the website and a logo, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is because 
there are billions of websites out there and billions of social media uh, connections. And so the challenge for anybody who's starting a business is to sort of cut through that noise so that your product gets out there and your customers can find you. And uh, so I think that's, that's the 21st century version of opening a storefront and waiting around for the customers to come. You can't, you can't do that in a storefront and you absolutely must not do that online because there's just too many distractions. And by the time they get to you, they will have already bought their product. Angelina. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I, so when I teach courses, to your point, I always um, talk about the movie Field of Dreams. I kind of date myself, but I always say, you know, in the movie, they say, if you build it, they will come. I feel like a lot of businesses feel that just because they built a, a website, people are automatically going to go to it. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm like, that is not even half the battle. That is like 25% yeah, of the battle, yeah. you know? The rest is driving awareness, whether it's, you know, using traditional or digital, whether it's ads, email, using your personal network, et cetera, et cetera. Um, absolutely, I totally echo Barbara's point that um, just because you build a website does not, people are, it does not mean that people are going to visit and you have to drive awareness. And the other piece to Barbara's point is, you know, today after this call, I have five client potential new client meetings. I would never be able to do that if I had to go and visit them face to face. You know, Zoom has definitely created this ability for me to be more efficient and effective. Now, do I miss the interaction? Yes. You know, and so I, I do look forward to more events and more networking and more conferences and more face to face. But for sure, I think this whole um, idea of online and doing meetings online convenience and efficiency of it will stay. Uh, absolutely. And one of the things uh, and the Night Watchman had actually pointed out in terms of technology, and Lloyd, you have a, also a space that you're in there working with young, youthful entrepreneurs, you know, uh, work, working closely to actually help them promote their stuff. Uh, I know about the N National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, NIFTY, uh, and uh, other things. So tell us what also has drawn, uh, drawn you to those tech-savvy young people and helping them to also get their uh, word out and th their particular business idea. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it kind of goes back to my story, right? It goes back to me being this 10 year old kid in Brownsville that wanted to start a business, but didn't have access or support or guidance. So I wanted to make sure that I started something for young people as well. Uh, so we, we have a program called Start an Empire. It's a social entrepreneurship program where young people uh, really just identify a problem in their neighborhood. Um, and they solve that through, through business. So it can be like, we have four programs going on this summer. You know, one people, you know, some people are focusing on like trash and garbage in New York City. Somebody else is focusing in on gun violence. Another group, another group is focusing in on uh, mental health. Uh, but essentially what they do is they design a product pretty much like merchandise, but also they launch a pop up shop at the pop up shop. They kind of showcase their solutions and sell their product and make money. But we walk them through the process of creating a business plan. They pitch it. So it's like a real life experience versus just sitting in a classroom and uh, learning about entrepreneurs without actually doing it as a cohort to let them know that it's really a team sport and it shouldn't be a solo sport. Um, and the purpose of it is not one, to show them that you can uh, solve problems locally, but two, um, you know, if you wanna start your own thing, we kind of already supported them and they have all of the steps necessary to be able to start their own thing if they wanna do it because now they know how to do it, <laughs> do the program. Uh, but in terms of like technology, I think, um, you know, I think one, it's really like optimizing your website and optimizing all of your social media channels as well. So I, like I look at some homepages and they are, it's not optimized. Even if you do build awareness, somebody visits your website, <laughs> people are not going to like the experience of the website, right? And there's people behind what that looks like so a boring website can turn a customer <laughs> off <laughs> yeah gotcha. like gotcha. the positioning and yeah it's a lot to it so, so mm -hmm. that, your program sounds awesome like the for for young people yeah it's very inspiring yeah absolutely so yeah i guess one of the things that i was, I was thinking about in terms of uh understanding the market 
the uh, the, uh, the clients that you're working with. Uh, so so Barbara, certainly we uh, we already heard about the business plans. We know about that, and working with nonprofits, certainly there is their mission statement. Yes. So, so beyond that, uh, the clients that you work with, do they understand the, uh, their clients? That they, uh, do they understand their market? Do tell. I would say yes and no. I, I know that's going to be a little equ equivocation, but um, most of my clients, when they come in and they want to start a nonprofit, they are driven by a passion to help or and or personal ex or family experience with a social or health problem that they would really like to address or a, a, they're, an art, they're artists and they want to help, whatever those kinds of things. So at that level, yes, they get it. They, they understand that um, there are tremendous needs to help homeless people, to help victims of domestic violence, to help uh, survive, uh, people who are mentally ill, so, um, uh, children who are struggling to learn, um, people of all ages who, who need arts organizations to help express themselves and enrich their lives. So yes, they get that. They totally understand that. Translate the, the, the trick is to translate that understanding and passion into a business, a larger market, because there are lots of other organizations out there who also are trying to work some very well, some not so well with these populations. There aren't enough services but the, that doesn't necessarily mean the fact that there's a need does not necessarily turn into the good old economic demand and funding that it would follow for you to expand that. The other, um, the other challenge I think that people do and don't understand in non nonprofits is that um, a lot of nonprofits are uh, founded the way for-profit businesses are on what I call the better mousetrap theory, that people think I have a better way to do it this existing organization is old and tired or this product is old and tired and I have a better way of doing it. And so trying to break through the fact that there's already large established organizations providing these services um, is sometimes a challenge for people who are trying to found a nonprofit to um, understand because you're competing for dollars from donors and public agencies and foundations along with all these other nonprofits. So why should a foundation give your organization a grant? They have a stack with high, I probably can't see my hands, but <laughs> <laughs> a good high stack of, or an inbox full of submitted online applications. And so they're looking for reasons to say no, because they, they there's no way they can process or fund all of those applications. So it's, it's that from that standpoint, it's a challenge. It's understanding the need for the services. I think most of the clients, at least who I work with, do understand the need. Um, that's not an issue. The problem is the business side of it, attracting funds and developing real programs with qualified combination of volunteers and professionals to provide the services or the products to address those needs. Beautiful. Can I, can I add, yes, add, add to that from the, um, I work with some nonprofits, but mostly for-profit organizations. And the, um, I've done some uh, teaching with uh, small groups of women entrepreneurs in um, certain uh, communities that, you know, distressed communities. And mm -hmm. um, one thing I, I uh, suggested to them was, again, think beyond yourself, beyond what you're offering. Mm -hmm. Can you partner with one of your colleagues in this workshop mm -hmm. and um, come up with a new product? Or, or if you're, um, you know, designing bags and they're importing coffee, could the coffee go into your bag? <laughs> and then you have a new product and you have a bigger customer base. And, um, you know, I've seen um, some restaurants do this, like, you know, an Indian and a Peruvian restaurant came together and, and came up with a new product. So then they have, you know, more more clients, they have a new product, you know, it's, it's exciting. So I, I think um, in marketing, it's, it's good to brainstorm and think outside the box, think beyond what, what you're offering. Um, can you, can you leverage it? Can you look at, look at a bigger a bigger or a bigger client, like would the government, would the local government want to purchase what you're selling? Would the federal government, um, would a corporation, there's a lot of supplier diversity programs out there you can apply to. So there's just, 
you know, it's a big world. <laughs> There's a lot of options and, and like a business plan, you know, your marketing plan should address like, what can I do, you know, at all different levels and, you know, what has the best opportunity for success, you know, lowest cost, highest return kind of thing. And, um, and I think it, it opens a lot of doors in, in one of these classes and in, in their discussion, the women came up with, Oh, it was before Mother's Day and they decided to do a pop-up store. So the like 10 of them were, you know, going to a parking lot and setting up um, all their, their products and stuff. So, you know, it was exciting. And I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities if you, if you think um, strategically. Mm -hmm. And collaboration, I see. And okay. collaboration. Yeah. You got it. Angelita. Yeah, I've got, yeah, oh, I've got, got, I've got a question I wanted to ask Lloyd. Um, and it's about uh, specifically about young people and getting them into entrepreneurship. Now, a lot of young people actually have an advantage because they've grown up in an e era of social media. A lot of them understand social media a lot more than people of our age and stage. And they know how to generate a crowd online, but they may not have the business acumen to understand how to turn that activity into uh, revenue and profit. So tell me a little bit about how you interact with younger people and instill them uh, business concepts that relate to how businesses operate in today's uh, era. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you have a lot of young people that are, like to your point that are super excited. Um, they know marketing, they know how to edit videos and Put them out they have a 14 year old niece that knows how to edit videos like crazy you know, for, for youtube and everything else um but i think the challenge for young people really is more so char like character like the hardest part of managing a business is managing yourself uh <laughs> it's not even the technical skills really because you can learn that on youtube right like i think youtube is becoming like this new university where you can essentially learn anything uh, but the hardest part for any of us, including a young person, is management of self. It's character. It's the, you know, integrity, the honesty, the hard work, the perseverance, the resilience. It's all of that stuff. Um, like, I have a lot of young people, they have a lot of ideas and, you know, they come and go and, you know, they start something today and the next week they have a different idea. <laughs> so it's about commitment more than anything else. So I think we want to instill, you know, uh, those characteristics in young people. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Angelina, do tell. You know, because you're the brand expert that I know. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No, no, <laughs> not at all. No, no, no. Uh, we have market other marketers on the on the call. Um, you know, with, with youth, and, and this is a more personal experience where, you know, and you have so many, call, on, being online today, you know, especially after the pandemic and high school and, and, and college, everything pretty much being virtual and, and remote. Um, I Obviously, I think it's pro from a business, but, but from a youth standpoint, I, I think it could be even a little detrimental because they're not understanding the whole or given the opportunity to do more of the um, the personal piece. Uh, like I said, you know, a lot of my colleagues and I were like, oh, we can't wait to go to a networking event. We can't wait to go to an expo or a conference. Um, but I feel that that personal piece is, is lacking with, with youth, right? And, you know, when I Last week, for example, I had a very short term uh, project of making outbound calls. We had to make 3,000 outbound calls. And the number of youth that I reached out to, high school, college, and just no response or they flaked. And, you know, you don't really, all the older, you know, 30 plus, you know, they were getting back to me and they showed up. So I feel that youth today, you know, because there's so much opportunity, they feel that they don't, um, you know, they're not committed to to anything as much as somebody who's who's older. Um, that's my opinion, at least. 
Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Uh, I, I guess one of the things now, and this is the big one, I'm going to use the B word, bookkeeping, finances. Do tell, what is the advice that you give the small business uh, clients? Barbara, go ahead. I would say you start, and I always tell my clients this, you start from day one with a good bookkeeping service. When you have no money and nothing coming in, you can use QuickBooks or even set, if you're adept at Excel, set something up. But nonprofits get screwed up very easily if they don't keep track of money, uh, particularly when they get to the point where they're awarding, whether where they get a grant or a contract. Um, it's very easy to get in a, over your head. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get into a lot of trouble. You can get in trouble with the IRS. You can get in trouble with the New York State Attorney General. You can get in, if you get a contract from New York City, you can have the Department of Investigation on your, on your back. Uh, for uh, and sometimes it's just ineptitude. You don't know what because you you're well intended, but don't know what you're doing. Um, other times, and unfortunately, there have been examples of this in the nonprofit world too. There's fraud, and so you know, people are always looking at your money. And the other mistake that that nonprofit clients make while they're getting started is they will accept donations from friends and family and put them into their own bank account, which is an absolute absolute. <laughs> No, 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 in all caps, underlined six times, because that that's revenue to you. That's income to you. And then even if you're able to sort out and say, well, this $50 was really for my nonprofit, for the nonprofit, not my nonprofit, et cetera, et cetera, it's just a mess. And I've had several clients who have lost their tax exempt status because they have not bothered to keep the records. They've not bothered to file their tax returns, et cetera, et cetera. They just get so totally overwhelmed that they you know, they sort of let it all fall by the wayside. So start from the beginning. It's like any any business that you're doing. You're never going to know how much money you're making, how much money you're spending, where the money's coming from if you don't start from day one to keep track of it. Got it. Angelina. Oh, for sure. You know, absolutely. A thousand percent. Everything that Barbara just said, um, especially with the nonprofit piece when I was there at the nonprofit for eight years. Um, yeah, there's, there's just, you know, and, and today, me personally, I don't even pay invoices. I, uh, you know, submit everything to my bookkeeper. She's very reasonable. Uh, you know, she provides me with all the reports. And the great thing is, you know, there were a lot of um, grants that I applied to, and I was blessed to have gotten three or four of them last year during COVID. And that was because I had my, my taxes, my profit and loss, I had all of my ducks in a row. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say it more if there's, you know, my team, you know, my consultants, my lawyer, my accountant, um, absolutely a thousand percent. Excellent. Adina, uh, for you, I know, because you've mentioned about working in the, in that particular sphere in terms of public sector contracts and, and so mm -hmm. forth. So you guys, I know, are sticklers in terms of uh, bookkeeping and financing. Uh, do tell the experience. Yes, I agree with these two ladies 100% <laughs> about uh, keeping track of everything. When when I started many years ago, I, I had an Excel spreadsheet. And, and then after a while, you know, I use an accountant for my, um, you know, home, personal um, expenses. And then she uh, took over the business, you know, monitoring the business expenses. And, and I switched a few years ago to, um, in terms of like paying client, paying my um, consultants, I use an online platform, ADP, where, um, you know, the, they can put, everything's online. So it's an online time card. They put in their time, their tasks. I run the payroll. It takes like 10, maybe 10 minutes, maybe five minutes every, you know, once a month. And it's, um, super easy and you know they offer a lot of other things i don't take advantage of everything they do but um and uh so it, it's it's so helpful to have everything in one place and as angelina said if you're going after any grants or contracts you need to show um all that data easily and even you know the ppp loan there's a lot of um grants and, and loans and contracts that they all require you know, standardized accounting. So it, it's really a, a crucial pillar of your of your business. And it won't 
starting out, it's not going to cost you very much to, to hire an accountant because they're not going to have a lot to do because you're just starting. <laughs> but at least you have everything in the right place and they're going to save you money because they know the tax system. So, you know, that's a benefit. It's not just you're paying them, but you're, you're reaping that, those benefits as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Lloyd, you, of course, coming from the public sector with uh, SBS uh, Business Solutions <laughs> Center, whatever, you know that uh, the city is all over it in terms of making sure that stuff is right. So what, what have you been doing ad advising your clients in terms of their books and finances? I mean, yeah, there's so much, right? I mean, I remember like when I first started, I wasn't even myself um, putting money aside for taxes. And then I had like a big tax bill for thousands of dollars, <laughs> uh, which I was like, how the hell am I going to pay this? Uh, I wound up, you know, paying it down. But now, you know, I have a separate account where I just put every time I get paid, I put, you know, X percentage aside strictly for tax purposes. Um, I think a lot of businesses can get caught up with that. So that's one of the recommendations that I make. Definitely having a bookkeeper going in at least once a week to uh, kind of like reconcile all of your accounts mm -hmm. um, and to categorize them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, you got to follow the data, <laughs> right? So the data tells you, the numbers tells you like which one of my products are most profitable. Am I spending too much money on contractors? Um, what are my margins and gross profit margins? And it's, yeah, it's a lot. So by having a bookkeeping system, it really gives you the data that you need to be able to make informed decisions. Like maybe I need to fire this client because I'm not getting paid enough. Maybe I need to like do, you know, increase my pricing because my margins are really small and I need additional money to cover some of my fixed expenses and have a profit. Right. Mm -hmm. so, but if you don't have access to that data, you're going to be you know, making a lot of mistakes for a long period of time that could be that you could resolve easier and faster if you have data. <laughs> so. Uh, so, so let's say, and, and I heard uh, Angelina, you have your cadre of experts, uh, uh, but I do know that there is, let's say, software out there such as like QuickBooks and other things. Is that something that you can do solo, your own, or should you be spending time doing that? Just tell me, uh, someone answer that. All right, so yeah, I use Wave Accounting, which is actually free. It's very similar yeah. to QuickBooks. It's called Wave. It's I don't pay a, a, a monthly subscription uh, like QuickBooks. Um, so that would be my advice. When I first started, I was doing my own bookkeeping, but now I hire a bookkeeper, right? Because I want to spend my time on high yeah. value activities. Okay. So, I, I yeah. think the, the, there's also the fact that you have to you have to instill the habits because. The bookkeeper can help you if you're not keeping track of your receipts. Um, mm, but mm. what some of those online tools can do is simplify that. So QuickBooks, Xero, XERO, you can, you know, when you have a lunch, you can take a picture of your receipt and upload it into your system. Now, there, there's a lot of tools that can help you put it in place, but you have to have the practices. And I think what all these panelists are talking about is whether you have an outside help or inside help, um, if you're not instilling the practices early on, you're going to run into problems later. So it, it, it comes to the question, um, which I would throw back to everybody, are what are the most important things to get from startup to sustainable? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know You know what? Uh, Night Watchman, I think uh, what we're going to do, because we uh, see we're winding down here, uh, zeroing in on Night Watchman's question, let's go around and also provide some final thoughts. And also, how can one get in touch with you guys? Angelina. Uh, I'll start with the last piece you just said. Getting in touch with me is Angelina at ambin.nyc. So A M B L Y N dot N Y C. Um, how do you get from startup to um, sustainable? You know, I did not leverage, I didn't do this, but now I regret not doing this. I did not leverage my contacts um, as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I find that today, whether it's some of my elected official friends, because sometimes I work on campaigns, Mm -hmm. um, people that I used to work in corporate with, you know, obviously city because I worked with SBS a lot. Mm -hmm. So looking for RFPs and uh, leveraging my network that I didn't necessarily appreciate or maybe I didn't even know, you know, Um, but as a minority woman, they're always looking looking for uh, contractors and I'm, I'm certified with the city and the state. So I would say one, you know, one asset that you have that maybe you have not leveraged is, is your network. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Dina, do tell some closing thoughts as, as well as also uh, where can f- folks find your book? Do tell. Yeah. I have a cover right here. It's an ebook, so I don't have an actual book, but <laughs> marketing for challenging times, your toolbox for success. The cover is done by a, a Peruvian artist, um, mm. Diana Risco Um mm. And uh, it's on uh, Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can just search for Marketing for Challenging Times. Oh. And um, you can find my company at uh, dinatobinconsulting.com online, our website. I'm setting up a, actually a teachable course that's coming up. Um, there'll be some news about that soon. And... Um, I have a YouTube channel with some of my webinars. And um, I think this year, I mean, uh, I think we've touched upon a lot of the systems you need to make your your business, help your business to grow. And um, I know Barbara mentioned passion for nonprofits. I think the same thing holds for for-profits, that you, you have to be passionate about what you do because you're going to be really investing your heart and soul into that, into that business. And um, one thing that I... Um, so my to-do list for this year, which I've done, is is set up a CRM, Customer Relationship Management uh, mm. software system. And that's been super helpful in terms of, I had an Excel sheet, you know, putting everybody into that and then targeting, you know, it helps you narrow down who's opening your emails, who's responding to your emails, mm. who's interested. And um, so you can really focus on, um, you know, those uh customers or clients with the best potential for um, business or new repeat business or new business. So that that's one tool I would add to. May I ask? Um, I use something called Softfront, S-O-F-F-R-O-N-T. If you um, email me at uh, Dina at dinascovenconsulting.com, I'll give you some more information. Uh, But yeah, very, very, um, I had some training on it that, that was very useful and then but um it, it's i highly recommend you get a, something like that to really target your marketing beautiful beautiful uh, and and barbara of course you never closed you used to do stuff in person now of course everything is remote so uh some closing thoughts and how can one get in touch with you if they want to do that one-on-one counseling Okay, if you want counseling from SCORE, you can contact us at newyorkcity.score.org. And uh, there's a block called Request the Mentor. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, it's barbara.grummet at newyorkcity.score.org. But we have mentors in a, that can help any stage of business, any type of business in, in the economy. So it wouldn't have to necessarily have to be me. The best way to transition from idea to reality, from startup to success, is a combination of things. First of all, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> but you're not promoting yourself. You are promoting your organization and its mission. And then beyond that, it's the idea of utilizing uh, your networks and uh, building a network, starting something even with very limited to no funding. Um, if you're, you know, because you need to have a track record, you need to show that you know what you're doing before people are, are going to be willing uh, to invest in your nonprofit by making a donation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lloyd, do tell some closing thoughts and l- let us know. Uh, I, I heard the, the shameless self-promotion. That's it, Dina. That's no. a, <laughs> so what do you, <laughs> what, do you <laughs> what do you do, my brother? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, my, my clients are government agencies and nonprofits and corporations. So, but you can reach me, progressplaybook.com or Lloyd at progressplaybook.com. 
my final, I mean, I would say you can't grow a business beyond your capacity, right? Your capacity and the growth of your business go hand in hand, right? So if you understand, you could think about it like a, a liter of water, you can only handle a liter of water. If you have a gallon bottle of water, you can handle a gall gallon of water. So but capacity is really about like your systems and processes and uh, access to resources um, and team. So if you want to grow, you got to build capacity. So I think as you're focusing in on business development, marketing and relationship, you also have to focus in on capacity building. <laughs> because right. You can't right. manage, you can't manage what you're bringing in, then it doesn't doesn't mean anything, right? You, your business will will falter. So I think that business development and capacity building needs to be focused on simultaneously. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I definitely want to uh, thank you all, panelists. This has been an incredible discussion. I mean, a Angelina, Dina, yes. <laughs> ba ba Barbara, I Lloyd, I thank you. And Night Watchman, has this, this been spectacular or what? Absolutely, absolutely. A great, great panel and some great advice for anybody who is contemplating jumping in the waters of entrepreneurship now is a great time to do it but but reach out to these experts get the help and make your dream happen absolutely Sounds and like uh, one, a little, one little question i had for you uh lloyd in terms of the program that you're going to be launching with nitra only for nitra residents what if i have some dreamers who are not nitra residents <laughs> yeah this one is only for nitra residents gotcha yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, no worries no worries well <laughs> well thank you all lovely i'm gonna uh, uh, hopefully you will come back uh, uh later you. and yeah. uh discuss more uh, see uh, let us know that your journey continues okay thank you thank take you care. thanks great opportunity Bye. Bye, everyone. you got it. take care guys all right Bye -bye. thanks everybody <laughs>